Okay, Boker Tov. Uh, Pesach soon approaches. Our daf is Ayin Bet. And uh, we picked up about uh, uh, five lines from the top. Four, last word, the lion, Hahu. We're in the middle of the issue here about selling wine to a non Jew, which led to all the questions about how do you finalize a sale with a non Jew. And we discussed, Tosis discussed selling the ear of the animal so to get out of Bechor. And then we discussed the relevance of all of that for selling Chamech. Anyway, so we're so now we so now because we're in these issues about sale and when is the sale final, we have a little bit of a digression before the mission, which really has very little to do with what we've talked about until now. Um who Lechavre, somebody said to his friend, uh I am Badamadala, five lines from the top, last word on the line. Who Gavadamale Lechavre, he mizavina e mazvinana la laha ara. If I ever wind up selling this land, Lecha Mazvinana, I'll sell it to you. And apparently they did some kinyan on that. Okay, some handshake or sudar. Well, not a handshake. Let's say a kinyan sudar. Um, then in the passage of time, the guy went and he sold it to somebody else. He broke his promise. So, Amar of Yosef, Kanakama. No, the sale to the second didn't work. The first one owns it. Now, um, Ra, the, the assumption here is, a, that there's a Kenyan, although that wasn't mentioned. There was some type of a Suda, or else how could the first one own it? But B, that the, what you did when you did that Kenyan is you didn't just make like a promise. I promise I'm going to sell it to you. Because that's like a discussion in the beginning of Baba Basra, Kenyan's Varen. Like, you know, even if you do a Kenyan on a promise, there's no bindingness, legal bindingness to the promise. You know, I mean, even like in American court, sometimes you can sue for breach of contract, of oral contract. But that's just like getting, you know, even if, they'll, if the court will recognize that that's just for like you know getting some type of of uh of like uh, of of damages it's not actually that the sale is final it was just a promise to sell so anyway so what you have to assume here is that he didn't just say i promised to sell and did a kinyan sudar but actually they did a kinyan sudar on the sale so i went ahead and i said to my good friend gloria gloria if I ever wind up selling this land, I haven't decided if I'm going to sell it. But if I ever wind up selling it, I'm going to sell it to you. Let's do a Kenyan right now on the land that will be effective if and when or retroactively from the day that I decide to sell it. So you have to assume that's the context. Because if that's not the context, the question is like it's a, it, it's a moot point. Obviously, it's just a promise. It didn't take effect. Okay, and Rav Yosef says, assuming that type of a context, that it actually worked. So Amalei Abaye, so Abaye challenged Rav Yosef, and he said to him, follow Pasak, but they didn't set a price. So even if you did a Kenyan on the, on the land a, a year ago, a month ago, 10 years ago, when you said you st that if I wind up selling it, I'll sell it to you, you never agreed upon a price. And therefore, the Kenyan cannot be final. No Kenyan is final if the price isn't agreed upon. Um, even if you did the Masa Kenyan. And where do I know this from? That if you didn't set a price, the Kenyan doesn't take effect. Did not. We taught in our Mishnah. It's Tamar. Tamer from Omer. Where do I know this from? Where do I say this from? Okay. Hamocha yeno lo v'kochavim. Pasak atshelo madat amav t'mutarim. Madat atshelo pasak tamav asurim. If the guy did a mishicha, took possession of it after you fixed the price, then it's okay. He owns the wine before he had a chance to touch it. But if he took possession of it before you fixed the price, then it's forbidden because he doesn't own it yet because the price hasn't been fixed and he touched it or he had an ability to touch it. And now it's your stam yenam and therefore you, you can't get benefit from it because he doesn't own it yet and now it became forbidden. So you see in our Mishnah, the sale is not final until after there was a fixing of the price. So that's a pretty darn good proof, okay, that uh, no, no sale works if you haven't fixed the price. So Gemara says, so my Havila, okay, that was a good re response I had to Rav Yosef. What was there for the conclusion? So the Gemara says, my Havila, what was the conclusion? Kedachamim, like you just said, Abai had a slam dunk proof against Rav Yosef. No sale is final without a fixed price. What's the question? If Yosef was wrong. So the verse says, no. Maybe under normal laws of, me of Mecca Chumemka, or of transactions, we would say, if you do a Kenyan even without a fixed price, it's final. But in our Mishnah, because we're strict by Yei Nesach, we're going to say, maybe it's not totally final, and therefore he had a chance to touch it before he owned it, and therefore it's a problem. 
So maybe in our mission we're being strict to say it wasn't totally final because of Yenesech issues, but maybe in general it, monetary matters we would say it is final. So you can't 100% prove it from the Mishnah. So let's see if there's somewhere else we can prove Abayi's point from. Fine. So the Gemara says, Tashma, um, come in here. The Amar of Inibar Avin, Uvda Havi Bey Rav Chista. There was a story like this in the house of Rav Chista. Rav Chista Bey Rav Huna, and Rav Chista had a story like this in the house of Rav Chuna. Upashte, and Bey here might mean also the base Medrash. Upashte Mehadit Nan. And they concluded it from the following Mishnah, a Mishnah that's not about Yenesa, that's all about finalizing a sale. Masha Chamar Vupoalov. Here I am, I'm buying um, some uh, oranges from my good friend, um, um, Gloria, and Gloria's having them delivered to me. And she sends them through a donkey driver who's got all these sacks of oranges on the donkey. Or on a, uh, she sends them with her, uh, with her delivery guy, and he's got these sacks of, orange, of oranges on his back. Now I go ahead and I draw the, you know, I, I, I lead the delivery guy or the uh, donkey driver um, into the Ichnis on the and bring them into my house. Okay, so Bein Pasak Ad Shelo Madar, Uvein Madar Ad Shelo Pasak. So in that case, where they're still on the backs of the delivery guy or of the donkey, I can't take possession of them. They're, you know, somebody else is holding on to them. So whether I did, we agreed to the price before I drew, brought them into my house, or I brought them into my house and then we agreed on the price, it really doesn't matter. The sale isn't final. They're on the backs of the delivery boy. Both of them, um, uh, it doesn't work, but either of us can revert, retract the sale. It's not final. Parkan, if I unloaded them from the delivery truck or whatever, the donkey, and then brought them into my house, then is it final or not? It depends whether we fix the price. If we fixed a price before I drew them into my house, the sale was final. I did Mashiach, not only Mashiach, I did a Kenyan Chatzar, they're in my house. Okay, but the key is, I did a Kenyan and there was a fixed price. Now the sale was final. Madad Atul Pasak, however, if I weighed them, brought them into my house, and we have yet to fix a price. Even though I physically took possession of these crates of oranges, and they're in my house, since we haven't fixed a price, either of us can retract. So that is a quite explicit Mishnah, that even with the biggest Kenyan in the world, if you don't have a fixed price, the Kenyan isn't, the sale isn't final. Okay, and therefore, in this case, even though I agreed to sell Gloria my field, and maybe we even did a Kenyan trip, she should take possession of the field, since there was no fixed price, the sale was not final. Very nice. Now the Gemara is going to have another story like that. Who Gavra, the Amalei Lechavre, somebody said to his friends, I went and I said to Gloria, same thing, if I'm ever going to sell this plot of land, I will sell to you with 100, for 100 zuz. So we set a price, $100, and we did a Kenyan. And the Kenyan was just conditional on the fact that I, if I ever decide to sell it, then this, then you should take possession of it as of now through this Kenyan with $100. Okay, so should work if I ever decide to sell it. But then I went ahead and I sold it to some other person. But may have essen, because this other guy was offering me 120. So Amar Rav Kahana, Kana Kamas, Rav Kahana said, uh, Gloria owns it. You decided to sell it, so your original transaction with Gloria is effective. Maski for Rav Yaakov Midar Pekod, Rav Yaakov Midar Pekod challenged this. He said, Hai Zuzay Ansua. You, I was forced by the temptation of money, by the high offer that the guy was willing to pay more than the actual market rate for that field, and therefore my sale to Gloria is not final. Now, why not? I, didn't I sell it to her on a stipulation, on a condition, and the condition was met? So, um, you know, it sounds like you could frame this in one of two ways. You could frame this as, number one, uh, like, yes, technically the condition was met, but 
in my mind, I only meant if I'm ever going to sell it at the market rate, I'm going to sell it to you. Like I never, it never occurred to me that somebody would offer me so much more money and, and, and had somebody, and that was never part of my implicit stipulation to glory. I never meant to include a case where I was offered such an excessive amount of money. In that case, I, I, I wouldn't have wanted to sell to her. I would have wanted to go where the money was. Okay. So that's one thing. Like it's implicitly a, 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 a limitation of my agreement or of my stipulation was Gloria was a case like that. Okay. Of course, you know, like, I mean, don't try to use that in a, in, a, in a secular court of law. I mean, the whole reason people enter into these contracts, right. With like that they have the, you know, that they buy what, not what's it called, not the right of first refusal, but they, but they, anyway, they, you know, they, the, 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 Gloria, you should know, you must know this. Like when, when like you're dealing an with option. like real estate, an option, right. To buy and so on. You can't say, well, I never would have sold you the option. Had I realized I was going to be given the whole point of the option is that you can exercise it. Okay. But anyway, but that's like, not to um, mention these are rural countries. Well, yeah, I, but I don't know. That's an interesting question. Like, rural countries in American law don't right. can't cover real Right, that's a, good, that's a good question. Like, would it have been so. different if it was written, and then we would have thought that you didn't have as many qualifications, right? So anyway, so, any, but that, so the other way of sort of saying it, a more extreme way, by the use of the word onus, the money forced me, is it's almost like I'm saying, like, I wasn't looking to sell it. I only agreed to sell it to Gloria if I chose to sell it. Here, I didn't choose to sell it. I was forced to sell it because somebody made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Okay, and when I said, I'll give you if I want to sell it, means if I'm deciding to sell it, not if I'm being pressured. So the money is pressuring me. Anyway, it's either way, it's pretty interesting that that allows me to get out of my deal. Okay, so now the Gemara continues. Um, and we rule like the latter position, which is pretty amazing. Um, now, Let's say, not a case where I'm being tempted by some other offer. Um, I, get, I sell to Gloria on, based on the price. And remember, we have to fix the price. But, but I don't give an actual number for the price. Here's what I say for the price. Amale, I say, I'll sell it to you based on the value as assessed by three people. So since I mentioned three people, I mean three, the normal assumption is I mean three men, and I mean a based in. And the word shimi, shuma, which is like an, to, assess, is to assess. assess, means like an act that basin does. You know, they send an assessor and they uh, and they evaluate it or whatever. So it means based on the decision of a basin. So shama is an assessor, shama. Really? Is that really true? Okay, can you shime with lasa? That what if I say that, I feel it train me go to It doesn't have to be a consensus of three. Since I am implicitly creating them as a based in, okay, then that means any two votes wins. So even if two out of three people agree upon a price, that determines the price that now I'm going to sell it to Gloria for it, even if the third one dissents. Now, the other question is, of course, which based in are we talking about, right? If you want to say a based in, who gets to pick which based in and which three people? We'll get to that later. If I say kid ami betlasa, not as is assessed by three, but as three people will say, so that I, word will say, that verb is not like a based in type of an act, okay? And therefore, I'm not conceptualizing them as a based in. And in that case, Adami Bitlasa, they all have to agree and they all have to have a consensus of the same price point. Um, now, let's say I say as is assessed, so that's a verb used by based in, but I say with four. Four is not a based in, okay? So I'm presumably now no longer operating in the based in model. Wait, but the, the based in is a max of three? Well, it usually is three, and anyway, and it's you, and even if it's more, it's it's an odd number. Four is not. I, if I had said the word to shine me, but based in bar, but would have been different. Mm -hmm. But my presumption when I'm saying four is that I'm not referring to a structure of a based in. So if I say kidashaimi barba, adami barba, similarly, it goes by the four have to have to have a consensus of what the value is. Certainly, if I say a for say, that I don't even use a verb that's used by based in. Okay. Now, let's say I say as three assess it, and we say that means that I'm structuring them as a based in, and it's any, whatever the agreement of is of two out of the three. The Asu Tlasav Shamua, and the three went and they assessed it. The Armale Idach, and now the other one says, I don't know who's the one and who's the other one, but let's say anyway, a based in I pick assesses it, and then Gloria comes and says, Lesu Tlasachrini, the King These guys don't know their job. These guys are not expert assessors. I want a different, we agree that you sell to me at the price as defined by a based in. I want a more expert based in. 
to come and assess it, which seems like a reasonable point since nobody identified which basin are we talking about. It does sound like implicitly, if I'm the one selling it, I implicitly have the right to choose the basin, right? It's not like it's totally up in the air, but if Gloria has a claim, a very specific claim, not just I want to pick my own basin, tough luck you want to pick your own basin, I'm the one selling it. But if her claim is these guys aren't expert, then maybe we say, ah, well, that's already a legitimate claim. And then maybe we get to pick, she gets to pick a different basin. Okay, so that's what Rav Papa says. Um, Rav Papa, in that case, if Gloria has a legitimate claim, why she doesn't want to use the basin I picked, she has a right to object. And then, I don't know, she gets to pick another basin, I get to pick it, but she, as long as she can't object to it. Okay, but she has the right to make that objection. Um, challenged this. Who, who knows? To, to, why should we presume that Gloria is right? Well, who's to assume that the next based in is any more expert than the first based in? Maybe this one is more expert. We rule that way that just because she raises an objection doesn't mean that she is correct. Now it sounds like it, it, it sounds like let's let's say she just stomps says it without any backup evidence. Okay, then it's like, well, how do we know she's right? But let's say she actually has backup evidence. Let's say Gloria actually says, you know, these guys never have no experience. I've never seen them assess property before. They're not licensed, et cetera, et cetera. Is that a good objection? So it sounds like the answer is that's still not a good objection because how do you know the next basin will be any better? But okay, but let's say you do know the next basin will be better. Let's say Gloria will say, I want a basin that's licensed. You know, with as assessors, so then presumably no, it is a good claim. Real, whatever real estate agent, no but it's not exactly clear. Like you know, it doesn't sound like fundamentally she can't object. It just sounds like she can't object out of thin air. Like you need some concrete basis to a to to, to claim that this basin doesn't know enough what they're doing, and b that the other one will be any better. Okay. Anyway, that was a bit of a digression. Back to Yein Nessa. Next Mishnah. Not all as a mishpach. So you have a funnel and you've got your barrel and you're going to put your funnel in the, uh, you know, wine uh, bottle of the non-Jew and pour from your bigger pitcher through the funnel into the wine bottle of the non-Jew. Now there's a concern that there's some wine left in the funnel from when you poured into the non-Jew. Now it's all kosher wine. But when it hits the, the vessel of the non-Jews, you know, the bottom of the non-Jews wine bottle, look, it's sort of like this case I've got here, except all we have to do is add a funnel, okay? So here's your funnel, all right? And here is, right, the wine bottle of the, whatever, of the non-Jew. So when the wine, right, goes in here and hits here, here it's kosher, when it hits here, it becomes yei nesach. Maybe because he's got some drops of, of, of wine there. Maybe because what hasn't yet been fully clear is once he takes possession of it, in theory, he has the ability to touch it, and therefore it becomes yei nesach. So the wine, when it hits here, is yei nesach. Okay? Here it's kosher. Then you're going to take this funnel and now use it for, right, to sell to a Jew. And it has, presumably, some drops of wine left in it. And the assumption is, because you poured it here, and here it mixed with or became yin nesech, the drops of wine that are now in the funnel are also problematic, and now you're going to use it for a Jew, and now you got a problem, because now the Jew is going to get some of that yin nesech mixed up in his wine. Okay? So let's take a look. Okay, if there is some type of um, of uh, hold back of the wine, some type of remnant of the wine from the first pouring, then it's a, still a problem. Some of the gear said akavak was a kuf, I guess the word akav, you know, the footsteps of the wine, the footprints of it. Anyway, if there's some remnant of the wine left in that funnel, it's a problem. Um, if you are pouring from one vessel to the next, what you're pouring from is permissible, and what you're pouring into is forbidden. 
okay, which basically means, okay, we're going to talk about whether it's a Jew pouring or a non-Jew pouring, but it basically, if we talk about a Jew pouring into the non-Jew, it sounds like what it's saying is, here you're pouring me kli al kli. When it hits the vessel of the non-Jew, it's forbidden, but what remains in your vessel is permissible, which is totally fine, okay, except so what remains in your vessel is permissible, but somehow the stuff in the funnel is forbidden. So we're going to have to figure out why is the stuff in the funnel forbidden. The stuff in the funnel never got into the vessel of the non-Jew. So that's going to be, and now finally, finally, we are going to get to the discussion which we have been alluding to or referring to for many dapim, which is the question of whether nitzok is chibor, whether when something is being poured, is it considered one unit and is it considered to be connected. Okay, so let's take a look. Okay, Tnan Hasa. We taught over there in a Mishnah in, in Taros. Hanitsok, Nitsok is exactly a case like this. Okay, this is Nitsok. You have wine that is sort of you know pouring down from one vessel and it's whatever, it's going somewhere else. Okay, that's Nitsok. Okay, that's Nitsok. Um Hakatafris, Katafris is that it's going down at an angle, okay? So here you have stuff that's going down here, okay. This is katafras. And umashke um, tofeach. Uh, umashke tofeach means here you've got, you know, let's say you've got this little amount, this amount of liquid, this amount of liquid, and between them you've got a very thin layer of liquid. And that's mashke tofeach. Now, that is contrasted to tofeach amanat lahatpiach. Okay, tofeach means there's a thin layer of liquid, okay, but if I, and if I touch it, like, you know, my hand will get wet, okay? But what is tofeach amanat latfiach? Tofeach amanat latfiach is I touch it, and I lift my hand off, and there's enough moisture left on my hand that now if I would go ahead and touch something else, that other thing would get wet, okay? That's tofeach amanat latfiach. It's enough that you can actually transfer it somewhere else. That tofeach is a, is a thinner layer. It'll get your hand a little bit wet, but you're, you won't be able to touch something else and get it wet. So the question by all of these things is, well, the next line in the Mishnah is, all of these things are, chibor letumo letar. Chibor letumo, I'm sorry. Eino chibor lo letumo velo letara. Is not a connection for tumor letara. But ha'ashboren, if it's like a collection of water, a pool of water, chibor letumo letara is a chibor. So what does it mean, Chibur Lutumu I'll give you an example. Let's say, here I am, and I'm Tamei, and I touch, okay, this little collection of water here. I make that collection of water Tamei. Did this water become Tamei? Was it like it was one big unit or not, if they're only connected by this tiny, thin film? Let's say I touch here. Did I make all of this water tame, or fruit juice, or whatever wine, or whatever it would be? Okay, um, or you could say I touched up here. Did I make the stuff down here tame? Okay, I mean eventually if it rolled down, that's a different story. But you look at it all as one unit. Okay, I went ahead and I touched this. Did that make the stuff at the bottom tame before the? You know, obviously some of it will get into it. It'll be a different story. Or I touched the bottom. Did I make the top tame? Okay. That's the question whether Nitzok and Katafris is a Chibur. You got that? So if it says it's not a Chibur, it means I did not make them come in. That's it's not a Chibur L'Tum'ah. Okay, what is L'Tahara? So L'Tahara is that um, if, let's say, I've got here a mikvah, okay? I have here a kosher mikvah. And it's got this thing, and here, here I've got a little collection of water which is connected because, you know, here's a smaller uh, a well. It doesn't have 40 sa'a, but they're connected through this string. If it's considered one unit, then when I go to the mikvah here, I, this is one big long mikvah, and it's like one big body of water, and I'm tahor, because this connects them, okay? And similarly, in this case, all these types of cases, right? I've got, I've got two wells, okay? This one has 40 sa'a, this one has 20, and there's this thin layer of water of mashke tofeach that connects it. If I go into this mikvah, 
I'm not tahor. We look at it as two bodies of water, not as one. If this was tofeach, I'm not lahat piach. If it was a thinner film of water, we'd look at it as all one big mikvah, and even if I went here, I'd be tahor. Okay, so that's what you need a for chibor for tumen tahara. So this says that these things are not a chibor for tumen tahara, but a shboren, a collected body of water, okay, that sits between two other bodies, is a chibor with tumen tahara. So that's all very nice for tumen tahara. We've seen before that we connect aspects of tumen tahara to yei nesach, right? Questions about an ama aretz, are we concerned about they touched it or not? Certain questions about what type of a touch of a non-Jew makes it tamet, makes, makes it yei nesach, is it like the touch of a zav? You might remember before there was a question, kol shebezav tamei, you know, is ose ye nesach. So there are all these connections to, to, to we, do we, you know, do we, so between tumatara, between and ye nesach. So what do we say about cases of ye nesach? If you go ahead, and this is going to be this case, right? If the non-Jew touches the wine at the bottom of this vessel, or just we say the wine at the bottom of the vessel automatically becomes ye nesach because it's in a non-Jew's vessel or mixed with drops of wine at the bottom, if nitzok is chibor, it's like all of it became ye nesach. That would explain why the wine left in the funnel is a problem. But if nitzok is not chibor, only the stuff at the bottom is ye nesach, and the stuff that remains in the, in the, in the funnel is not. So that's exactly our question. So let's take a look. So, um, it might be that these things are not a do not are not a unifier for tumatara, but they are a unifier and they are considered one unit for yenesah. Um, so, where do you get this from? The Mishnah says, It says that these things are not a combiner for Tumatara, and your and your deal, your inference is the Tumatara, who do have a chibor, have a chibor for Tumatara, they're not a unifier, but for Yenesek they are. Maybe the Tumatara, why did it use those words to indicate that there's other things for which the this this does create one unit? He says. Amasefa, look at the end of that Mishnah. Hash Boren, collected water, Hebrew Litu Militara, is a unifier. So should we also read that to say only for Tumantara? Litu Militara, who dave Hebrew? Halinian is a Chloavi Hebrew? So maybe we should read that to say, oh, but collected water works for Tumantara, but it doesn't work for Yenes. That would be crazy. You want to say Yenes is stricter, right? So you, you can't read in the words of Tumatar and the Mishnah to imply that the opposite is true by Yenesech. Then you would come to contradictory conclusions between the beginning of the Mishnah and the end of the Mishnah. You can't figure it out from that Mishnah. I appreciate that might be your position, but you don't have a basis for that in, our, in that Mishnah. Your, but your position is that Ye Nesach is stricter than Tumantara for these halachas. Now, what we're really going to try to figure it out and is based on our Mishnah. Because saying Nitzuk is a Chibor is the most logical way of explaining our Mishnah, of explaining why the wine in the funnel is a problem, since the wine in the vessel is a problem and it's all connected through this pouring. Okay, it's not. Let's look at our Mishnah. Not the less at a Mashbech, who mandal the top Suchis of Shalovitel Hov, and the other mandal the top Suchis of Shalisrael. In Yesh Behena Kavas Yayin Asur, if there's still some drops of wine, it's forbidden. Okay, so. Those drops of wine, how did they become forbidden? They never went into his vessel. So, lav benitzok. Obviously, it's through the fact that they're connected to the bottom of the vessel through this sense of being poured. So, So you can infer from this that nitzok is a chibor. That seems like a pretty darn good proof. So, the man says, no. Tani Rebbe Chia, Rebbe Chia teaches in his Breita a way of qualifying this case in the Mishnah. That the, uh, the that the that the, uh, the, the, the 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 wine bottle basically slapped in the face the wine in the wine bottle slapped the face as it were of the uh, of the uh, what do you call it um, uh, of the funnel meaning that the reason this is forbidden is because the drops here don't become forbidden right away as soon as the wine starts getting poured no as the wine starts getting poured the drops here are totally okay. But the wine keeps on collecting and collecting and collecting, and eventually this fills up, and some of this doubles back into the funnel. 
So it's actually the only reason the funnel is a problem is because the wine that's already in the uh, you know the the, the uh, bottle you know double backed into the funnel, and that's why it's a problem, but not because it's connected through this pouring. All right, so that gets us out of proving from this that nitzok is a chibur. So the Gemara says, um, my, my, um, <coughs> excuse me. So the Gemara says, okay, if that's true, let's infer from this bright the opposite conclusion. My. So what would you say if it didn't, the wine in the, in the bottle didn't double back into the funnel? So you would say low. You'd say the funnel isn't a problem. If that's true, so let's conclude the opposite. The fact that we have to limit our case to where the wine double backed, let's assume that if the wine didn't double back, then it's all okay. Nitzok is not a chibor. That seems to be a reasonable conclusion from that Tosefta. So the Gemara says, no. No, no, no. What Rabbi Chia was saying is, if the wine double backed, it's definitely forbidden then you really have the wine from the bottle back into the funnel. Need so, if it didn't double back, Rabbi Chia is implicitly saying, Tibai, I don't know. So what you can infer from this is not that if the wine didn't double back, it's okay. If you didn't double back, it's not clear whether it's okay or not okay from Rabbi Chia. Since Rabbi Chia says the case that it's definitely a problem is that the wine double back. Okay, so given our Mishnah, we would assume Nitzok is a Chibor. Given Rebbe Chia, we would assume Nitzok is not a Chibor, or at least that it's questionable whether Nitzok is a Chibor or not. So we don't have an answer. Tashma, come in here. Let's do the second case in our Mishnah. Hama'are mikli l'kli. You're pouring from one vessel to the other one. Etcha'am ma'are mimenu mutar. Okay, so here you are, you're in this case, and it just says, forget the, uh, you know, forget the what do you call it, Forget the uh, funnel, okay? You're just pouring from one vessel into the other, okay? And it says, what you're pouring from is okay. The stuff at the bottom of the vessel is no good, okay? Again, either because it's stam in the, the vessel of Ananju, maybe because it mixed with some drops of wine. Okay, but why is what's in here okay? Okay, well, there's two questions. A, what's left in here? And B, what's the story of not what's in this vessel or in this vessel, but the stuff that's in midair? Is that okay or not okay? And this is all the Nitzok question. This is no good. If Nitzok is a chibur, all of this should be no good as well. Okay? Because it's all one unit. So let's take a look. Um, okay. Tashma. Uh, what you're pouring from is okay. Ha, the beni, beni, asur. But what's in midair is forbidden. Shma mina Nitzok chibur. So why is this forbidden? It must be because Nitzok chibur. And somehow I guess we assume that the stuff that's still in the vessel doesn't count towards the neat soak, right? It's still considered in its own separate space. But the stuff that's in midair is part of the neat soak. And since it says what's in here is okay, the implication should be that this is a problem. And this is only a problem because of neat soak. It's all combined. Okay. Shmami na neat soak chibur. So the says, no. He neat soak chibur, afilu de gavi de You can't get away with that. If Nitzok is a Chibur, then even what's in the pouring vessel is all connected. So it should all be forbidden. So actually, the, the opposite is true. Since it says that what's in this, the pouring vessel is okay, it makes it pretty clear that Nitzok is not a Chibur, because otherwise it's all connected. So the Gemara says, no, that I can get out of. Halo Kasha, the The case I could be talking about where what's left in the vessel is okay is if the guy turns it over, he starts pouring, okay? Basically, you'd have, you'd have to be a quick actor. He started pouring, and this is stage one, and it hasn't yet gotten into this vessel, okay? And then stage number two is he writes this thing back up, okay? And the wine here is still, I don't even know if this is possible. I guess if you have enough of a distance, it's still passing in midair, okay? And therefore, and then, so he, he turns this back up. That's Makatev Kitufe. He, like, breaks the stream. And then stage number three is that it finally, here, gets into the vessel. So when it gets into the vessel, okay, the stuff in the original thing is okay because it's not connected. It's not part of a stream that's connected to the bottom of the vessel. You got it? He broke the stream before the wine hit the bottom of the vessel. 
And that's why what's in here is okay. But Enochinami, if he was in the middle of pouring and it was all like this, as it was hitting the bottom, we would say Nitzok is a chibor and it's a problem. So we're arguing, since the Mishnah says this implies that the stuff in the middle is a problem, that proves Nitzok is chibor. And based on this, this actually should also be a problem, but our scenario is he broke the stream in the middle. Okay? Ini shumhas, let's read that again. Uh, it says, It could be a case where he broke the stream. So the Mark says, Okay, I've explained the Mishnah that the stuff in the middle is a problem because it's combined, the stuff in midair. So from the way I read the Mishnah, Nitzok is a Chibor. So haven't I proved it? So the Mark says, No, you haven't proved it. Look at the end of the Mishnah. The receiving vessel, the wine in the receiving vessel is forbidden. Ha, so, it's, so that says, so, so who da asur? It's the stuff that's in the receiving vessel is forbidden. Ha beini beini shari. Did I skip a line? No. Uh, the line starts with Hadabani, of course, from Tosos Kocha. From here, you can't prove it. So the Lord says, What was your whole proof that Nitzok was Chibor? Your whole proof was, it says, This is okay, which implied that the stuff in midair is a problem. But the end of the Mishnah says, The stuff in the receiving vessel is no good, which implies that the stuff in midair is okay. All right? You got it? So the Mishnah says, this is okay, this is no good, and it doesn't tell us the status of the stuff in the middle. So don't say to me the implication is the stuff in the middle is no good, and that proves Nitzok is chibor. No, the, there's, it, there's no clear implication about whether the stuff in midair is good or not good. Okay, so because we don't know the status of the stuff in midair, you cannot prove from our Mishnah whether Nitzok is chibor or not chibor. So we're still stuck. You still can't prove it from our Mishnah. All right, move, let's move on. Tashma, come in here. We're across from the Tosos Kocho. Two words in. Tashma, lines up the word Mina. Tashma, Hama'ara mi chavit lebor. Hilua chayore misvas chavit lemata asur. So this seems to be very clear. You are going ahead and you are pouring from your barrel of wine into a vat of a non-Jew that has in it, you know, also his wine and ye nesech. So it's going to all get mixed up and so on, and it's going to be forbidden. Okay? So the the the, the stream that goes from the barrel into the well is forbidden. So this is very explicit that even the mid-air stream is forbidden. Okay? You got this? Right? You got it? It's just like this case. Except here it is explicit what you're pouring into is not a, I have to ruin my nice little my store story example. Anyway, what you're pouring into is a, a is is a is a well, is a big vat. Okay, you're pouring from your barrel into the non-juice vat. At the bottom of his vat, he's got some of his own wine here. That's forbidden. Okay, this is pouring in, and it says. The stream, it says, is forbidden, okay? So if the stream is forbidden, that's a pretty good proof that Nitzok is chibor, right? Because this stream isn't mixed up with this wine, but we're looking at all as one big unit, all right? So, So, although it does only say from the edge of the barrel, which still raises the question, why is the stuff in the barrel not forbidden? But we're going to bracket that for a minute. A minute. The fact that the stream is forbidden seems to show that we're talking about mitzvah chibor. All right. So targum of says, but ovi kochavim hamaare. No, you got it wrong. It's not the Jew who's pouring; it's the non-Jew who's pouring. So why does that matter? So then it doesn't even matter that he's pouring into a well. And the fact that he's just pouring, it's like the standard example of the non-Jew pouring your non mavusha wine at your table, having a non-Jewish waiter. Okay, this is very important, everybody. This is the question of whether can I have a non-Jewish waiter pour my wine. It's kosher wine. Why can't he pour my wine? He's not touching it. So the answer is, the asimikoho. Since his energy 
is causing that wine to move out of the bottle, it's like he moved the wine. Okay, so this guy is a non-Jew, and because he's a non-Jew, actually pouring into the well is irrelevant. Because he's a non-Jew, he's moving this wine, and since he's moving, it's the non-Jew pouring your aim of which wine for you at your table. That's like you touch that wine, and that's what makes that wine forbidden. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's going into a well that has also maybe some problematic wine in it. And nothing to do with the idea of Nitzel Chibur. It's not because it's connected. It's because he's moving that wine. So the Gemara says, <laughs> Which, by the way, you could have asked with the, uh, what do you call it, with the Nitzel Chibur as well question, but okay. Why is the stuff in the barrel okay? The stuff in the barrel is also moving due to his energy. Right? As you're pouring out from that bottle of wine, some goes out of the barrel, but even the stuff in the in the bottle is like is moving from the bottom of the bottle to the to the to the lip of the bottle. So why is that okay? So the Gemara says, no. The idea that we're concerned about his energy rather than his touching is all rabbinic. I mean, the irony is this whole thing is rabbinic because the whole thing is about Stam Yena more than it's about Yenesha. But anyway, okay, that's all rabbinic. It's only his energy. He's not actually touching it. Um, uh, where were we? Um, uh, it's only a rabbinic problem. Who did not think liberai, gazru barabanan. Who did legavai, lo gazru barabanan. So since they said the stuff that actually moved out of the bottle, out of the barrel, and maybe that's the stuff in air that's easier for him to touch anyway, and it's where the movement is more visible. So if it goes out of the barrel, it's like he touched it, and it's a problem. The stuff that's still in the barrel is okay. So by the way, just to pause here for a moment, you realize that what this would mean for a non-Jew who poured your uh, Enam of Vusha wine. If he poured your Enam of Vusha wine, the stuff that came out of the bottle into your cup, that would be into your glass, that would be a problem. But the remainder of the stuff in the bottle, based on this, should be okay. Does everybody get that? It's a pretty straightforward point. You could even make a stronger argument in, our, in the case of a wine bottle, why the stuff inside the bottle is okay. You know why? Because there's no way you can get your finger into the neck of a wine bottle and touch it. It's even a better case than the barrel. So it's even less like you touched it, okay? So is that really true, by the way? that the stuff in the wine bottle is okay. So I have to tell you two things. First of all, there's even a debate of the post skin, whether if a non-Jew pours, I'm not saying this halach lemaisa for all those who are listening online or whatever, ask your local Orthodox rabbi the following, but I will tell you in theory, there are opinions that because if we say nowadays our nine Jews are not really Ovdi Avodah they don't really you do Nisuch of wine and so on, that therefore any non-direct touch is really not a problem. So there are those of the opinion that this issue here of Koho, and if somebody pours wine for you, that the wine that he pours in your glass is like he touched it, wouldn't apply now, nowadays to non-Jews because we say our non-Jews are not like as immersed in a Vodazara. So some actually are lenient about that, but the Evid, Bishasat Chakt, Hafsid Maruba, and so on. That's in terms of the stuff that's already poured, okay, which for this Gemara clearly is a problem. But the stuff that remains in the bottle, that should certainly be okay. However, there is a way to say the stuff that remains in the bottle is a problem. Why? Because here's what happens. This is going to actually get, I'm not going to tell you the answer yet, but this is going to get to our question of Nitzo Chibor. So as he's pouring it, this stuff is usser because of kocha, okay? Then he pours it into, yeah, let's have him pour it here, into your nice glass of wine, okay? Here's your nice little goblet of wine. I don't know if that's a goblet, whatever it is. That looks weird. Is that how it looks? Anyway, whatever. Oh, that would be the base. Yeah, it's not stable. Anyway, <laughs> he's pouring it into your little thing of wine, okay? So now, anyway, you've got that in it. So that's us because of Koho. Now that that's us, and it's collecting here, and it's connected back, maybe what's left back in your original wine bottle should be forbidden because of neat soak. Okay, you got it? So the way to make what's left back in your bottle, our Gemara is assuming, is arguing, neat soak is not chibor. And because neat soak is not chibor, only the stuff poured is a problem because he moved it. The stuff left in the vessel is okay. But if you add on this the idea of Nitzo Chibur, 
then you would say, this becomes Asr. Once this becomes Asr and it collects here, it goes back and it makes that Asr because of Nitzok. Okay? So let's take a look. But Argamar is assuming you're not saying Nitzok Chibor, and the only thing that is forbidden is actually the wine that is in, that has been poured, that's been moved by the non-Jew. All right? So that's what the Gemara says. Uh, so we still don't have a conclusion. Is Nitzel Chibor or not? We don't know. We know the stuff poured is a problem because of Kocho. We don't know if there's then an additional problem of Nitzel. Um, I, sh- I should say, let me just say one sentence and then we'll read the post votes, that Lehalacha, there is a major debate, as we'll see in Tosos, do we generally pask in Nitzok as Chibor or not Chibor? Okay? And again, though, since that's heavily debated, there's a steer in Shulchan Aruch if we pask in Nitzok as Chibor by Yein Nesach, all right? When it certainly comes to our cases, which is not Yein Nesach, it's only Stam Yenam, and we're dealing with, like, non-Jews nowadays, etc., again, there's, like, an, a, a, a strong, strong reason to think that we don't say Nitzo Chibor. So, and especially in this case, here's a Lamasa case, again, not Lamasa when I say, ask your local rabbi, but here, your non-Jew is pouring your Enam Avusha wine for you. So we're going to assume, we won't go by the leniency I mentioned before, we're going to assume don't drink the wine in your glass. That's like he touched it, okay, even though it was only indirect. But halacha, if this ever happens to you, ask a rabbi, because if your rabbi knows laws about stam yenam, right, you can basically, you know, there's good basis to say you can keep the rest of the wine in the bottle. Because even if we say this is a coho problem, we're not going to go back and say it's a nitzok problem. Because there's a serious debate if we pass a nitzok altogether, and certainly in this case where there were, you know, all these other points to be lenient. It's not yo nesach, it's stam yenam, he didn't really touch the wine, it's non-Jews nowadays, etc. So in that case, there's a very good basis to say that the wine remaining in the bottle is okay. But if this ever happens to you, ask your local rabbi. Okay, it looks like you want to say something, Gloria. You know about a case like this? No. Okay, okay. Anyway, I know people have had cases like this, and the rabbi did not really know the halacha well enough. All right, anyway. So now let's finish up the Gemara, and then I want to read a toast first. Okay. Um, Rav Chizda said to the, to the wine sellers, when you measure out wine for the non-Jews, make sure to like break the stream when you're pouring it, okay? Because he, he it sounds like he's concerned because of nitzok chibor. It'll hit the bottom of the vessel. It'll become yein nesech because it hits the vessel of the non-Jew. And then it'll go back and make everything in the barrel forbidden. But if you break the stream in midair, you for prevent the connection from going back to the barrel. Okay, so that sounds like we said before, and it sounds like Nitzo Kishibor. And if you look at a, this little Rashi, I don't know where to tell you. It's about 10 lines before the lines get wide in Rashi, maybe about 15 lines. It says, Nafzi Nifutse, one line over Nafzi Nifutse. Rashi says, The Itzel who benitzuk is really Nitzo Kishibor, Vchein Halacha. So there Rashi says, the halacha is nitzok is chibor. We'll get to Tosas' position in a minute. Okay? So he said to them, break the stream. So it shouldn't be a nitzok chibor problem. Inami nafzi nifutze. Or throw the wine into their into their vessel rather than pour it. So you don't have a nitzok problem. I don't know how that you're going to manage that. It doesn't all spill on the floor. Amalu Rav, lahanu shifuchai. Rav said to the people who would pour wine, you know, uh, maybe they, these were more the wholesalers into the wells of the non-Jews, or whatever. Hishafchisu When you're pouring out the wine, the likrav of the lesayeyo Here's a different issue. Don't going back to our earlier point about kocho. Don't let the non-Jew help you pour out the wine. Why? Um, because Dilma Mishtalisu, maybe you'll forget, Vishadisu Leale, and you'll sort of take a break and let him do all the pouring. Uh, and if he's doing all the pouring and he's not just assisting, then it's his energy that's moving the wine, and then it's like it touched the wine. The Usr, and it'll be forbidden. Okay? So this is apparently if you're pouring wine for Jews. Here you are, you're a Jewish store owner pouring wine for Jews. So, but don't let your non-Jewish owner do the pouring or even help you with the pouring because it'll come that he'll do the pouring and then it'll make the wine forbidden. Um, okay. Uh, where were we? Now, there was a certain person who was 
bringing up wine through a type of a, uh, this is like a straw that you're using as a, uh, what's it called? Not a, a, a siphon. A siphon, yeah. When you create like a little bit of a, of, a, of a vacuum and you do it as a siphon, okay? So you basically had, you basically had, here's the barrel, okay? Here's the straw. Like apparently, I don't know, the original straw is a gishta and then the one that goes into it and comes down or whatever is called a bat gishta. Anyway, and here's the other one, okay? And you're getting the wine to like flow through the Yeah, when she clearly defines this as a plaza. Right, it's a siphon, okay? So, um, okay. Also, we go call him, Anuch Yadei Agishta. So Ananzu came and he put his hand on to stop the flow. So here's the question. He's putting his hand here to stop the flow. Is he, he touches the wine at the very bottom of this straw. Is it like he's touching all of the wine that's in the original barrel, which is sort of like a neat soak issue, although it's a little different than neat soak because here it's actually not flowing down. It's a little bit like, you know, this here, all of this is like in a state of coming down. Here this is like stable and it's being pulled through a siphon. So it's a little different. So let's see what the halacha is. Um, Asri Rava Lukulu Hamra. Rava forbade it all. Um, Amale Rav Papa Le Rava, Amale Ravada Bar Masa Le Rava, Amale Ravina Le Rava, Bimai, on what basis did you forbid it? The Nitzok? Are you forbidding it on the basis of Nitzok? Are you considering this all like Nitzok and one unit? Shmas Mina Nitzok Chibor. Should we assume that you're saying that Nitzok is a Chibor? So from the fact that he was challenged this way, by the way, it sounds a little not like Rashi, that the Allah is that Nitzok isn't a Chibor. And that's why he's saying, what are you talking about? Is that based on Nitzok? So it sounds like Nitzo, according to them at least, Nitzok is not a Chibor, against what Rashi said before. Anyway, so his answer was no. Even though Nitzok is, might not be the Chibor, Shani Hasam to Kulei Chamra Gishta Bar Gishta Garya. Here it's being sort of like pulled this way, so it's more considered connected. I have to tell you, I don't really fully understand it. Here, gravity is pulling it down, and if I touch this, we don't say it's connected to what's up. Here, like a vacuum is pulling it up and through the straw, and somehow we say, because it's actively being pulled through the straw, it is more like it's all connected in one unit. Uh, somehow, I, I don't really understand why this is a more considered one unit than the case of the, uh, of the what do you call it, of the, of, of, of the Nitzel. Rashi says a little bit that like here, if you're putting your finger here, you're not doing anything up there, right? It's, this is stuff coming down on your finger, but you're not actually touching the stuff up there. Whereas here, because the straw is what's pulling it out, when you touch the bottom of the straw, somehow it's like you're sticking your finger into the thing because this straw is actively pulling it out. So by you touching the straw, it's like you're going back into the thing itself. So I sort of can hear it, right? In this way, it's falling on your finger and your finger is not touching the stuff above. And here it's pulling the wine out. So by you touching it, it's like you're in that barrel touching the wine. But anyway, the implication is without that special case, Nitzok would not be a keyboard, okay? Amamar Zutra Braid Rav Nachman, one last case, Kaniskinin Shari. Okay? If you have this Kaniskinin, which is basically a, um, uh, what, a, a, what do you call it? Now I have to remind myself what he says it is. Um, oh, it's some type of a thing that multiple people are like, you know, are like drinking from. Okay? So you've got this thing and it's got like all these straws. Okay? And here's a Jew drinking and here's a non Jew drinking from it or whatever. So the non-Jew is drinking, and the wine is going into his mouth, but it's not going back into the vessel, and you're drinking. So even though you and the non-Jew are all have your straws into this big tub of wine at the same time, okay, he is not, uh, you know, it's, it's, he is not touching the wine that you are drinking, all right? And I guess it's not a neat so case. Even though he's touching it up here, it's not like he's touching it down here. It's like reverse, reverse neat so, all right? The honey me the cutting pasik is Israel. That's only if you stop drinking before him. Of a cutting pasik of the if he stopped drinking before you, some of the wine that was at the tip of his straw, now that he stopped drinking, that wine that his lips touched that didn't go into his mouth is now going to fall back into the vessel. Okay? Low. That would not be good. 
Rabba Baruch Huna equal the Beirish Galusa Sharlu Lemash Lemishta Bekan Bekaniskanin. He allowed them to drink this. Igadami Rabba Baruch Huna Gufe Ishli Bekaniskanin. Maybe he himself drank from it. Tosos wants to know why weren't they afraid? How did they know who was going to stop first? Why weren't they afraid of that? Anyway, what I want to do is I want you to look at this toast. We have about one minute left about this big issue about Nitzo Chibor. So he has a whole discussion. Rashi Paskin's Nitzo Chibor. Rabbeinu Tam Paskin's Nitzo is not Chibor. And that's only when we're talking about Yei Nesef. When we're talking about Stam Yena, maybe it could even be even more lenient. So if you look at the end of this big Tosos, he says the following. He says, goes to the phone with this. He says, one, two, um, uh, three lines down in the wide lines, in the widest lines of Tosfos. He says, towards the beginning of the line, the Hashta, he says, if there's a large loss that will come because the non Jew touched it and does go back and make the rest of the wine that's in the pouring barrel forbidden and so on. It could be lenient like Rabbeinu Tam and say that Nitzok is not a problem. Aval, the Hefzid Muat, if it's just a small loss, it's better to be strict like Rashi and think that Nitzok is a problem. Okay, so number one major debate, do we pass it in the end, Nitzok is a problem. Amnon, and now it's very interesting, gives two scenarios. A few mother in Nitzok Hebrew. So Tosa says, too bad Michael isn't here because Michael always wants to know halacha. That all this halacha that wine in wine is a problem b'mashehu is only a stam yenam issue. It's only a yen nesach issue. By stam yenam, it goes by the normal halachas of shisha. Okay? And therefore, Tosa says like this. If you're doing something like this, and the reason this is a problem is because there are some drops of yen nesach here, and this wine is getting mixed up, Tosa says, actually, even if you were to say nitzo chibor, if you're talking about stam yenam, this wine is okay. Because all nitzo chibor means, it means like, okay, it's like these little drops got mixed up with everything. Well, guess what? Stam yenam is butter b'shishim. In the Gemara, it's a problem because the Gemara is talking about yenesach and it's b'mashu. So if you consider it that these drops got mixed up with all the wine, then all this wine is usher. But if it's stam yenam and it's b'shishim, then this wine is okay. You got it? So if that's true, when is Nitzok ever a problem? So let's finish the toast, folks. He says, um, So in this case, even if Nitzok is chibur, Okay, it's just a few drops of wine that gets mixed up and it's bottle of shisha. So which is the Nitzok problem? So here's the Nitzok problem. The Nitzok, the Mitzar, the Nitzok that's a problem, is heichi dami ki goch ay yayin mekalech min ha-chavit u ba'o v'kachavim v'naga v'ki luach ki hua Nitzok. Ki ha Mitzar, the man dama Nitzok kibor. Okay, the Nitzok question is not this. The Nitzok question is, comes Mr. Non-Jew while you're pouring your wine, and he touches it over here. So in that case, if Nitzok is Chibor, it's not a question of a mixture. If Nitzok is Chibor, the question is, what wine did he touch? Did he touch just this wine? Or did he touch all of this wine? Is this all one unit? So when it's a question of a tarot, a mixture, who cares about Nitzok? It's all Batel Bashishin. But when it's a question of touching, Okay, then he says, it's like he touched all the wine. And that's where there's a debate of Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam, if Nitzok is chibor. Okay, umikol makom heichashesh hefzin meruba, samchinan apsak Rabbeinu Tam. If there's a hefzin meruba, then we can rely on Rabbeinu Tam, and then we can say that Nitzok is not a chibor. So major machlokes, whether at the end of the day we pass in Nitzok is chibor. One last thing, the final thing I'll say is, the other Tosos, which we won't read inside, about the Gemara, about don't let the non-Jew pour it, and so on, okay, that is a case where uh, Tosos discusses that issue about does it matter who's doing the majority of the pouring, whether if, if the stuff is being poured by a Jew and a non-Jew, he actually has a scenario, I'll just end with this scenario. Here we have, this is being poured out, okay, into my thing, and comes the non-Jew to speed it up, he tips it a little bit at a higher angle to help it all pour out faster. Is that a problem of coho? Because since he tipped it, 
it's going faster? Or do we say, since it was going to get into my vessel eventually, it's not a problem of koho? So the next Tosos explores this question of the pouring of a non-Jew, and when is his pouring significant? When does his added energy a problem? And when is it considered, eh, the Jew is doing it anyway? It would have happened eventually anyway, and so on. So though, so this Gemara is huge halach lamas issues about the non-Jew pouring wine for you at your table, about questions about koho about Nitzok, and how much do we apply this to Stam Yenam, and how much do we apply this to the Jew, non-Jews we, we we sort of are dealing with nowadays. Okay, we'll end does, with this. Does so this apply to beer? No, it's all wine. Just wine.